Do you think that this really is a catalyst for real change or do you think it's still people just paying lip service to um, improving indoor air quality? Well, it, de it depends where, because uh, this is really now down to the, to the individual countries. This is not a global change. Even so, global change, global change is still, well, there's still one more step to do this uh, in terms of a global change. It is still better WHO uh, uh, briefing or recommendations. Uh, because this is ultimately what the, the world uh, listens to and the national public health authorities. And the current briefing is from the 30th of uh, April. And the way it words this, the uh, mode of airborne transmission, the first point, first dot point is that uh, the, the main mode of transmission is, um, However, the wording is uh, but short distance or, or most infections occur over short, short distance that one meter. Um, it doesn't specify, well, really which mode it is, whether it's inhalation or whether it's, uh, but it's that one meter. And then the second dot point is that the infections can also occur in um, crowded and poorly ventilated places. But then at the end of this dot point, it's still that one meter. So, well, okay, they can also occur, but this gives the way out of uh, to public health authorities. If the main mode of transmission is that one meter, and since they've already not that much mandated, but recommended that physical distance of 1.5 meter, like in Australia and different countries is different. So means that they've already taken, taken care of the main mode. Nothing else, isn't it just stay, stay apart? And then these poorly and crowded ventilated spaces, well, uh, public health authorities can always uh, claim that the majority of our places in Australia are not crowded and poorly ventilated. This is really relative because I'm saying often I'm now at home, but in my office at QT, which is small office, but still three people can comfortably sit spaced physically. And with three people there with mechanical ventilation, ventilation, this is crowded and poorly ventilated place, judging by the concentration of CO2. So this is, this is still, WHO still should say very, very clearly. And WHO still avoids the wording airborne transmission. Uh, now, the argument could be that um, uh, they have all kinds of other documents. So there's the roadmap, uh, roadmap for ventilation in the context of COVID. There is a, a, a document about uh, aged care facilities, a few others. So one may say, okay, there are all these documents. But then if you put yourself uh, in, in the shoes of, me, of minister or ministry of health, they are not going to start reading all the different documents about ventilation. Ventilation is not their business or, um, or uh, aged care facilities, whatever. Question is, is airborne transmission a health issue or not? And if this is not clearly stated, they, there's a way out of this. Um, therefore, in Australia, no public health authorities, uh, certainly not federal, clearly stated airborne transmission is a risk which must be uh, mitigated. So, um, so this is still what the WHO needs to do. But regardless of this, in different countries, actions has been taken in depends what in what it in what countries. So um, they've been recommendations of this nature, that nature and startups. I'm still planning to sort of get the group together and take stock of what, what happened where. Now, whether these are changes which will stay or changes uh, which I compare to the situation of putting a bucket under a leaking ceiling during a storm instead of fixing the roof, that's the question mark. Um, like, for example, the, um, in the, the Victorian Department of Education uh, announced, that was a few weeks ago, then announced a package uh, um, of, of measures. Among this is buying whatever number of thousands or ten, tens of thousands of um, air purifiers for the classrooms. Well, uh, all right. Uh, 
this is putting a bucket under the leaking roof because really ventilation needs to be fixed, fixed and if ven ventilation with proper filtration when necessary. But if nothing is available, okay, put that air purifier. But in a few years from now, in a year from now, nobody will be using air purifiers for all kinds of reasons. They will just go to junk and will create electronic junk. So, um, so, so this really issue is that whether something will, will change, but for something to change, standard national standards, each country's national standards have to change. If national standards wouldn't change, including, and we are talking about st standards, building codes uh, uh, in the rare quality standards, including specifically health in, in building codes and infection transmission, nothing's going to change. This is the reality. Have you seen any countries that have taken some real leadership in, in this area and uh, enacted um, standards that you think are appropriate? I think Germany has, and Germany has started working on this quite uh, quite early in the piece. Already last year, they've they've been they they had serious grants in order to improve ventilation. There was nothing mentioned about air purifiers or anything like this, but improvements in ventilation, and they listed quite a number of different spaces. Now, to what extent it is to improve ventilation, but to what extent it is backed by standards? This is something I, I don't have a full understanding because standards normally, uh, changing standards is normally a very lengthy process uh, under any circumstances in any country. So it's not like this, okay, change standards. It's al always a discussion about this committees and so on. So, um, so one could say that there, wasn't re there hasn't been really a time to change the standards. So the, and, and now we are talking about the, uh, the kind of things which happen behind closed doors. For example, I've heard that there are some discussions here within the circles uh, involved with the uh, National Building Council of Australia, but whether these are rumors, whether they are really working on something and something will emerge, it's, it's impossible to tell. So without really going deeply into understanding of what has happened in individual countries, it, it's very difficult at this stage to say what's permanent and what's just putting that, that bucket under the leaf leaking roof. So when I go back to work, hopefully in the next month, um, back into the office building, it's a, I don't know, 50 story tower in, in the central business district of Melbourne. Um, we don't have any windows that open <laughs> to the outside. Um, we have fortunately a, an air purifier um, in the office, but um, what, what can these, you know, built office environments do to, to protect workers? Well, if this is a mechanically ventilated building and by the description of what you were saying, it is a mechanically ventilated building. So, and particularly of this size of the building, there's got to be engineering team of, of, of somebody who, who manages this. And in principle, they should know what is the ventilation rate which is set up for individual areas. Now, they should also be able to tell whether this actually is um, whether actually ventilation in all the areas is according to what they assumed, which probably is not. Just judging by the simple fact that uh, the temperature, temperature is the easiest parameter to measure, mm. to set and to sense. And how many times? Well, in my office, it's cold and next door is too hot because they can't balance the temperature. Uh, well, everybody has this experience. So if, if the parameter we can sense and the, the control, the engineers can not set properly, what confidence it is giving us that the ventilation is working. So in this case, we cannot rely to, to, on what they are setting, what they think is happening. Measurements have to be done. And the simple first measure is on CO2 concentration. Now, this is a bit more complicated that it appears in mechanically ventilated uh, spaces. Uh, because um, like, for example, here it's window open and I have this CO2 meter here. It's showing slightly over the background, uh, well, which is still despite everything open, but maybe it's up there. So my breath goes there, but it's still slight. So anyway, anything what happens directly translates into this reading. However, 
if you are in a um, mechanically ventilated uh, uh, area where air is recirculated, which means it should also go through filters. So, um, but filters remove particles and possibly vi the virus or, or viruses, um, but they don't remove CO2 unless there is sufficient um, uh, in the supply air, sufficient outdoor air. So then we are sl sl slightly losing this direct relationship between the concentration of CO2 and the, um, and, and, and the infection transmission. So it may be that CO2 is elevated because it, uh, it's recirculated. Nevertheless, particles are filtered, mm. which obviously doesn't help to, to uh, simply uh, explain the situation, but well, Still, if CO2 is too high, there's a problem because it shouldn't be. It means that the, in any case, even if the, if the infection risk is lower, still, uh, still it's not right because it affects our performance. It affects uh, our, uh, we are sleepy and tired if CO2 is too high. Uh, I saw on the, the Osage website, it's got some really great stuff. Um, and I saw um, on the safe indoor air for kids um, diagram, which maybe you had something to do with. It, it gives, um, uh, under CO2 monitors, it gives like the low relative risk, moderate relative risk, et cetera. I'm assuming that all of these um, kind of levels um, are um, kind of universal. It's not just for safe air for kids, it's safe air for anyone really. Is that is that the case? That's right, yeah, yeah. This is, this is for schools because schools are uh, the main interest. The main interest in, uh, in Victoria, the, it's now an interest also in, in, New, in New South Wales. I don't think anywhere else in Australia. And no other environments are of any interest to anybody in Australia because only the Department of Education started doing something about this. So of course, this is relevant to, uh, to every office, to every public building, buildings where we, where we are. And of particular um, significance are um, catering places. Because, um, well, first of all, even if masks are mandated anywhere else, um, not in the restaurant for obvious reasons. Many restaurants uh, have just natural ventilation, which means no ventilation. If, well, if it's cold or, or if it's hot and then the speed system air conditioner is going and just turning things around. Um, and we spend the hour, well, hour, two hours, whatever, full room, perfect conditions for outbreaks and how many outbreaks occurred in restaurants. Mm -hmm. So this should certainly be targeted. This, even, this is even more uh, higher risk than in offices because in offices we are more, more spaced. We are not, it's not, usually not as crowded as it is in, in the restaurant. So, uh, and usually in mechanically ventilated business uh, buildings, it would be better restaurants, are, but, but no one is talking about restaurants whatsoever. I thought they actually were in New York and, and some cities where they're actually looking at, they're measuring CO2 levels and, uh, and are you familiar with anything um, in certain cities where they are starting to take this seriously? Oh yeah, yeah. Instead, I, 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 my comment was in relation to Australia, to the situation in Australia, because yeah. I think we are really, really behind the, the rest of the world. Yes, there are in in uh, in New York. There is a website. Uh, I, I had it somewhere. I could possibly find it, where people are encouraged to um, well uh, to take CO2 uh, a monitor like this, and then put put on this website the readings. Now there was some discussion to what extent this is. Um, uh, it's not. It's not about the ethics. To what extent this is could be challenged? Because let's say you put a restaurant and uh, whatever restaurant uh, and the name of the restaurant and high concentrations, and let's say that your monitor didn't work properly. So you put bad name to that restaurant. So potentially the restaurant can sue you. Uh, so so this were that kind of the discussion. What what to do? But as I understand it, there's a, I've, I've seen a whole map of this. Uh, I've seen this uh, in the new Spanish news. They were showing things like this uh, in, in some restaurants in, in what is Madrid or Barcelona, one of the Spanish cities. In uh, Belgium, mm, CO2 monitors are also uh, are used quite widely and they are mandated in some environments. So um, yeah, yeah, it, this is happening in, 
in in other places or in other countries. And you obviously welcome this level of interest. Oh. Oh yeah, well, I, I, I say that they should be a seal, seal to monitor on the wall of every public uh, space. Uh, and this is not something exotic because it was, I, I might have mentioned this to you uh, on some previous conversations, what I saw in Germany some years ago. You don't remember, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, a few, the good few years ago, I was busy, uh, visited, uh, visited a colleague, uh, a colleague um, in a research organization in Germany. Uh, and uh, well, there was a big spacious room, high ceiling, mechanical ventilation, little window open, just five of us spaced. So it looked that ventilation would have been good. Not that I thought about this for a second. But then there was on the wall, this quite large size, not like that small, quite large uh, monitor, CO2 monitor. Um, um, and uh, so the concentration, but also the traffic lights, uh, green, yellow, and amber. And I was looking at this and I was really transfixed to this because uh, I realized how, how quickly this concentration goes up and from green to yellow and then red, uh, top yellow close to red. And I was thinking, wow, I would, if I was asked uh, about ventilation in that space, I would have thought that it was good. I will send you that slide uh, with this um, because I've been using it well before, well before this pandemic. And so, so, and then they said, well, these monitors are used commonly in German schools to tell teachers and students what's the ventilation. So we are discovering something like it is something out of this world discovered during the pandemic. In Germany, it was used years ago and, and for this purpose. So. so I was just going to say that's intriguing. I, I wonder what got them doing this. What was the catalyst for them to do that? Well, Germans are very pragmatic people, and they they just pragmatically listen to science and te science and technology. They know that if CO two concentration is high, kids are sleepy, lethargic, and they are not progressing. Ventilation is needed. This is not new science. We've known this for. I don't know, a century, more than a century. So, so it is not why Germans are doing this, why, why we are not doing this. This is the question. <laughs> yeah, I think it is interesting, though, that G Germany has, at least for a short time more, um, a chancellor who is a scientist. Um, this certainly helped as well. This, this certainly helped as well. But the fact that, the, that the fact that the chancellor are like this was in Germany is just the credit to the Germans approach to things. So, uh, so it's, I don't think it's a coincidence mm. that. Are you talking to the, um, the air conditioning and ventilation um, industry? You know, are you giving advice to the people who are going to be um, planning new buildings and um, indoor spaces about this sort of stuff? Well, uh, I'm receiving daily about 10 emails uh, from different sectors of the industry. Um, not that they are asking me for much, they would be very happy to, uh, um, well, talk about their products and, and so on. The issue really is not, not just to talk to these people because these people will, these industries will not do absolutely anything if there's no change in standards. The problem is that if they were to do, to add something extra, which would cost even $100 more, the uh, whoever is the developer mm. and, and pays for this would not agree to this cost. And I give you an example, which I came, uh, I probably wouldn't have paid much attention uh, to this before, but now I do. Um, we have a little unit in the uh, Sunshine Coast. That unit is rented as part of the complex of 20 something units, and but we quite frequently go there. And one, and they were, they were changing the windows because there were some issues with old windows. So um, we came after this change of the windows and I can't open the window. The, the window opens and just this much. And there's some bolts stopping the window from opening. So, um, well, my interpretation was that they didn't finish this because the curtain wasn't, wasn't hung. Okay, so, I, so that they're still work in progress. But then I went to the, uh, to, the, to the manager and asking what's happening. Oh, no, no, this is according to the standard. What do you mean according to the standards? According to the standards, because this apartment is um, more than four meters above the ground. And according to the standards, and I'm not sure whether the 
this is Queensland standard or national standard, is that um, if anything is above that high, it has to have a protection against falls because well, anybody, particularly children, can uh, can fall out of the window. All right. Now, but there are different means of protecting against falls. You can put a screen like a metal screen here, which also serves a purpose against mosquitoes, and then no one will fall. Or there are certain uh, the, uh, mechanical guards, which, which, which would do this as well. But this screen costs, I don't know how much, costs another hundred dollars or what, the guards called cost also. So the cheapest way is just to block the window such that the, the opening is that small that, ch that a child head wouldn't go through this. The bolt costs next to nothing and voila, problem solved. No one will fall out. The fact that you've blocked the window and there's no ventilation, who cares? Well, that, this is as simple. So talking, mm. to the, uh, talking to the architect, talking to the people who are doing this, it, it's pointless. They will not do anything which costs. It has to be standard which change. Yeah, right. That's interesting. Um, okay. Do you have any suggestions for which companies are doing, are going to benefit from the increased interest in measuring CO2 and um, purifying air, things like that? Well, just simple Google who are the manufacturers and you, you'll know who will, who, will, who will benefit. That's very simple. There was actually um, in the May issue of the Choice magazine, there was a review of air purifiers, uh, which they always do a good job in reviewing this. So it will tell you which companies, uh, which devices are recommended and which companies. Okay. Um, but, but now, uh, most of these manufacturers are um, overseas manufacturers, like there's a really little manufacturing taking place in, in Australia. But in general, if we are serious with the new standards, with the new approach, this would benefit the whole Australian industry, building industry, architects and so on. This would be a completely new economy of this. It, it's that, that perception that this will cost. This will create new economy economy for health but we are looking at this this is just going to be a cost and nuisance yeah but when you also look at the savings of uh productivity if you have um, less absenteeism um because the things that we do for covid are going to be protective against influenza and That's rhinovirus right. and multi -ext extensively drug resistant tuberculosis um, right. many things yeah yeah, well, in our science paper, uh, the, uh, when we were finishing this paper, the editor wanted as much as possible to prove economic proof. There hasn't been a lot of economic analysis like this, but but one which we've quoted there was that uh, that assessment that um, the um, initial cost of lowering the this infections and so would only add one percent to the building cost. But the cost of the, um, mm. that, that, that was in the US, but the cost of um, uh, respiratory infections, and then again in the US, put together influenza and other respiratory infections, uh, they would add up to about, to about 50, um, 50 billion dollars a year. Of course, not all of them would have been protected, uh, prevented if, um, if ventilation was good, but let's say that half. Well, still, we are talking about huge number compared to that 1% of, uh, uh, of initial cost. But the problem here is that the money comes from different pocket, pockets. So the, someone else pays for the, uh, the building, the developers for the buildings, and someone else pays for the cost of infections. Well, for the cost of in infections, we are all paying through taxpayers' money. We are individually paying if we are sick. Uh, Absentees, uh, the, the, all the companies, institutions are paying if the workers are not working. So the, the, the costs are dispersed and someone else is paying for this. So that's also part of the problem. And for the politicians, the problem is that any improvements will not be seen during this term of the office. And the time scale for the, for the politicians is this term in the office. So that's another complexity of this. Yeah, exactly. Um, Lydia, I have to go in four minutes. I'm just wondering if, um, Kanako, if you have any questions for Lydia. Hi, um, 
Um, I have a question. I mean, I guess in future, like, um, I don't know about the situation in, um, in, in Australia, but in Japan anyway, it's like some of the schools are doing sort of, uh, um, like how to say, like sp spreading people, like, um, uh, um, like the, like when would be the timing that, um, um, the entire classroom will be able to come back to the uh, to 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 school and and have a proper ventilation. And if that, that, that if, if that was to happen, what is the ideal model um, in 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 your opinion? Well, what I uh, it's not just an opinion. We are uh, finalized. Well, uh, we've published a few papers on this topic, and this uh, this uh, is sort of the next level of uh, uh, assessment, risk assessment. Yeah. And for risk assessment, we take into account the infection risk, and the infection risk we take into account the ventilation, the uh, time of exposure, vaccine, the level of vaccination, and all the factors we can take into account. And based yeah. on this, we calculate at which point. R0, which is the reproductive number, will be below one because that's basically, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't be any infections, but R0 would be below one. So such analysis are possible, available, if anyone wanted to do this, which at the moment not seem to be very high interest in pub of public health authorities or any authorities. Mm. I, I can send you that, that paper or the link okay. to the paper. Cool. All right. Well, um, we'll let you go. Thank you so much, Lydia. It was great to see you and congratulations again. <laughs> Thank you. Good talking right. to you.